I'm, I'm going to talk about cave archaeology, restricting most of my talk to what's happened in the last 50 years, partly because so much um, of the important caves that were found to be archaeological were explored um, from the 19th century onwards. So I want to give a, a snapshot of what's happened in the last 50 years in terms of uh, discoveries and increased understanding of archaeology in caves, human use of caves. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the re-excavation of some of the old, well-known cave sites. Um, John Gunn mentioned some of those at Creswell Crags in uh, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, um, and say some of the reasons why we are revisiting those sites and recovering uh, more information. I'll talk a bit about the discovery of Ice Age cave art as an example of the kind of perhaps unexpected but uh, hugely important uh, new discoveries that can be made, in, in that case by systematic searching rather than by uh, stumbling across the, uh, the paintings. And I want to talk finally about uh, ongoing efforts to survey and digitise the resource. And again, John Gunn has set me up for that by uh, explaining the, the very large number of new caves and ca uh, amount of cave passage that has been discovered even in the last uh, 20 years. So we can talk about speleology as emerging as a, as a distinct discipline, in fact referred to so by some of the early uh, participants in the BSA, the British Speleological Association and the Cave Research Group, as a sporting science, trying to capture the idea that uh, understanding the science of caves did involve either the investigator or someone known to them uh, going into the caves and exploring the caves, and that's a sporting activity. During the 19th century, in the early part of the uh, 20th century, basically up to the end of the 1950s, the finds of archaeological materials in caves could only be understood indirectly through their associations with uh, animal remains, sometimes extinct uh, animals or animals only found today in Arctic environments, indicating Ice Age human activity, or through the cultural sequences, the uh, changes that you get from use of stone tools through the uh, use of pottery and then the uh, cultures using metals and so on. And these are cultural sequences. But one of the features of archaeological remains in caves is that these associations are not very clear. Material is often disturbed. There isn't necessarily a clear stratigraphic pattern. And it was really the advent of radiocarbon dating uh, invented by Willard Libby in the 50s. And from about 1960 onwards, uh, radiocarbon dating came within the reach of people uh, exploring caves. And indeed, some of the earliest radiocarbon dates that were published, uh, in this case 1960 in the, uh, the British Museum uh, date list. Uh, here's a sample from Antoft's Windy Pit, one of the Jurassic limestone caves in, in Yorkshire. Uh, a sample of charcoal from a hearth, 80 feet below uh, ground surface, was radiocarbon dated to give a uh, uncalibrated date before present of 3,750 years. Um, so one of the effects of radiocarbon dating was to provide an independent way of assessing how old uh, animal bones, charcoal, uh, human bones were. And uh, this actually had a slightly negative effect because a number of cave sites which were thought to contain the remains of our very old ancestors, dating of the human remains showed that they uh, were in fact much more recent in date. The carbon dating itself went through a series of sort of revolutions. The first was the introduction of calibration curves uh, from the uh, late 60s onwards, uh, radiocarbon dates could be calibrated. This is an uncalibrated date. It has to be adjusted for, uh, for the calibration. And then in the 1980s, uh, 
the development of new chemical methods and accelerator mass spectrometry meant that more precise dates, more accurate dates could be obtained on much smaller samples. So prior to that development, if you wanted a date on human bone, you'd have to date a whole femur or, or, or even half a skeleton. Uh, with AMS dating, very small samples came within the reach of radiocarbon dating, and museum curators were much more willing to, uh, to allow these dates to be undertaken. In the 70s and 80s, um, these sort of, I would call them early scientific associations, uh, were merged to form the uh, British Cave Research Association, which, of course, has pioneered uh, the development of cave science um, from, from that time onwards. This is also a period uh, where, when there were a number of large-scale archaeological in investigations, mainly of known Ice Age caves. Uh, examples would include the, the studies at Pont Newid in, in Wales. This is the uh, 2012 uh, final report, but there was a, a book published by Stephen Aldhouse Green in uh, 1984. John Campbell's work at a number of, uh, of these uh, late Ice Age cave sites, the Upper Paleolithic of Britain, which was uh, a publication of his PhD in the 1970s. Um, this is also a time when uh, scientists are using the new developments in taphonomy, so the understanding of how assemblages of bones and of other materials in caves, how they accumulate. Um, in this particular case, the role of owls in the accumulation of um, micro-mammal, small mammal remains in caves uh, was explored in very great detail by Peter Andrews. Of course, with the invention of barns, barn owls migrated out of caves and used the convenient buildings that were constructed probably from the Neolithic onwards. But prior to the Neolithic, uh, these animals are the, one of the main accumulators of microfauna in caves. And this really came because taphonomy itself only emerged as a distinct discipline in, uh, in the 1980s, initially with studies of uh, bones in Africa, but then became more widely applied. In the 90s and 2000s, um, we're sort of looking at less of the large-scale cave excavations, and often these targeted um, little keyhole surgery, if you like, uh, and usually at cave entrances. And alongside this, we have a much greater appreciation of the use of caves in the Holocene. So no longer thinking of caves as the haunt of Ice Age people, but of use right up to, through the early farming period and indeed right up to the historical period and, and even the present day. Um, we also have a range of uh, techniques in biomolecular archaeology which provide further insights into both the human remains and faunal remains from caves. And some uh, regional surveys and regional assessments of the cave archaeological resource uh, and this is where these uh, cave registries, the regional cave registries, are hugely important in providing a baseline of, of what caves are there and even just geo-referencing caves and giving them unique names so that when archaeological finds are made, they can be tied to a, a very specific location. Uh, John mentioned uh, Kent's Cavern, and this is from work in uh, 2015 directed by uh, Rob Dinnis and Chris Proctor, uh, looking at this end of the cave system, so Kent's Cavern, uh, a very large system back here, but this end of the cave, called the Northeast Gallery, was always suspected to be a, a blocked entrance. This is, this is the current way in through, through the show cave now. Um, but this excavation was particularly targeted at seeing what evidence was there for this being the, uh, one of the original access routes used by those very early humans who, uh, who's, who left their remains in this cave. So our, our understanding really has moved on, as I say, from caves as the occupation of uh, Ice Age people to thinking about usage uh, throughout uh, the time period, or, or throughout the past. And uh, occupation is probably... Uh, or is often appears to have been episodic. Uh, 
Uh, caves are, of course, suitable as refuges uh, for travelers and for seasonal usage. Uh, but also storage locations, um, concealed locations for caches, but also um, the caves are protected uh, environments, and we find this very much with the biomolecular archaeological work, that we're seeing that the constant low temperature and relatively constant humidity, uh, plus the slightly alkaline conditions, are, ver are very good for preserving not just bones, but also the uh, proteins and other biomolecules, DNA, inside them. And, of course, we have evidence that caves were used uh, for industri industrial use, but also the performance of rites and the um, creation of uh, artistic representations. Coming back to the point about these reinvestigations, so this is the site of uh, Merlin's Cave, which is up a cliff face in the uh, Y Valley uh, at Simon's Yacht West uh, in Herefordshire. Uh, this is a cave which was investigated in 1901 by Dorothea Bate uh, and then subsequently by Hewer and the University of Bristol Speleological Society in the 1920s. Uh, and by Nick Barton of Oxford uh, in, in the 1990s. Um, there is residual sediment in the cave, but it's, uh, it's a scheduled ancient monument, and there's, there's not really a justifiable reason for going in there and digging. However, outside the cave, uh, below the cave down here, you have Hewer's spoil heap, many tons of sediment from inside the cave. And then in um, just a few years ago, uh, a member of the public reported archaeological finds exposed in tree throws just below the spoil heap. And this, it turns out, was the location of a Dark Age cemetery. So in the about 600 AD, uh, people were burying their dead in front of the cave. And there's some evidence, and they were taking materials from the cave and putting them into the burial. So there's some evidence that this cave had a... Um, a meaning to the local period in that time period. Of course, the name Merlin's Cave is, our modern, is a modern name, and it's simply because the cave is near uh, King Arthur's Cave, which is just around the corner. Um, but we've done some excavations both here and um, at another cave site, which is about just over 200 metres uh, north of here, which doesn't even have a name. It's called uh, C19. It's got a number, but no, no name. And again... <coughs> Outside this uh, very small cave, so it's only about 30 metres long, um, there are uh, little platforms of deposits, and we think some of this, this particular one in here, T2, is uh, spoiled from previous cavers' excavations. And we put a small uh, test pit into there and one into the entrance of the cave. Uh, we helped recover this rather fine bone pendant artefact, which is probably of Mesolithic or of Paleolithic date. Uh, and this correlates with the fact that there are Paleolithic finds in the other caves and there are Ice Age faunas in, the, uh, in, in some of these cave sites. So there is much to be gained from looking through the spoil heaps of previous excavations and examining suitable places just outside cave entrances where some of the most interesting material may be found. Another site, of course, that was re reinvestigated is Church Hole at Creswell Crags, excavated in 1876 uh, by Boyd Dawkins and, and colleagues, uh, and that's an image of their spoil heap outside the cave. Most of the spoil was taken away, but in, in uh, 2008 we were able to investigate some of that spoil um, because of the find in 2003 of the, uh, the, the cave art, the engravings, in this case of the, um, the deer, with the modern graffiti on top. And, and very interestingly, the deer was given a, a little beard by the graffiti artist. So this means that someone, probably in the 50s or 60s, recognised the deer, didn't recognise it of being as, of ancient origin and, and added their decoration to it. Um, but this um, stylized animal, it's very, very similar to similar representations found in, in, at cave sites in France and North Germany, from the Magdalenian or the um, 
uh, late Upper Paleolithic. And, and the, the, this is evidence of a culture which was, was, of course, common to Britain and Europe because Britain was physically and not just culturally part of Europe at that time. Um, so our investigations here were to, first of all, find the original ground surface and also work through some of the spoil. And these are all items... Uh, that was on the ground surface, those two uh, upper Paleolithic blades. But these, this little uh, juvenile elephant tooth, the pottery, uh, the bone tools, these were all in the spoil from the previous excavations. And one of the advantages there is that many 19th century finds were treated chemically to preserve them. These, of course, had not been retrieved during the excavation, so they were pretty much uh, pristine as, as they had been inside the cave. I'll briefly mention um, some of the biomolecular work, which is, uh, which is really paying dividends. Um, Carsington Pasture Cave is a, is a classic bone cave in Derbyshire. Uh, we have over a 1,000 identified faunal specimens from that cave and human remains as well. But this particular bone was um, found in a near-surface chamber. It's uh, a humerus of an aurochs. It's dated to 6738 uncalibrated BP, so that's late Mesolithic in date. But the important thing is it's aurochs, it's wild cattle. It predates the origin of the introduction of domesticated cattle, which happened about 5,000 BP uncalibrated. And um, this bone turned out to have very well-preserved DNA. Uh, the uh, bi biochemists were able to extract, first of all, a complete mitochondrial genome sequence published in 2010, and then a complete nuclear genome for the aurochs published um, a couple of years ago. And the point about having this, this genetic evidence from the extinct ancestor of our domesticated cattle is we, we can resolve stories about how domesticated cattle, which were introduced from the Near East, as they were brought up into Northern Europe and into Britain and finally into Ireland, we've got evidence of genomic admixture from the ancient aurochs into the newly introduced domesticates. And this is suggesting, or one interpretation of this, is that the early farmers in Britain were aware that the, the native aurochs, it didn't go extinct until the Bronze Age, that the native wild cattle had some genes which would help their domesticated cattle um, do well in these environments. So we don't think it's accidental. We think it's deliberate cross-breeding that's responsible for this. Now, surveying the cave resource. So uh, John rightly pointed out there's over 5,000 known caves recorded, greater than four metres uh, in length. Um, we would like to know how many of those contained archaeological material. Well, many of those caves wouldn't have been suitable for occupation. They might be vertical entry or they might be wet caves, but I think at least half, probably 2,500 caves, could have been used in the past by earlier peoples. And we have some uh, direction about this from previous surveys, looking at a systematic sample of caves and finding out what proportion of them have evidence, archaeological evidence, indicating that they were a focus of activity in the past. And from previous surveys, we had figures between 15 and 20 percent. And then uh, about 10 years ago, we did some systematic surveys in the Peak District and in the Yorkshire Dales. And we pretty much corroborated those values. So a little bit higher density in the Peak District, but uh, plenty of archaeology in the caves of the Yorkshire Dales. So if you talk, take a ballpark figure of 20 percent of caves, of suitable caves have archaeological remains and scale that up by 2,500 caves. That's an awful lot of archaeological caves in Britain. And most of these caves have not actually been visited by archaeologists. Finds are still reported uh, sporadically. And uh, there's a very um, great need. And I think um, this is one area where citizen science can really make a big contribution because you can record these kinds of attributes by surface survey. You don't have to go into the cave uh, to record most of this information. Um, and these sorts of rapid walkover surface surveys 
uh, can produce quite valuable information. In the Peak District, uh, we were able to show that uh, the larger caves, the ones with a larger entrance size, and the caves higher up in the landscape, the ones which have greater uh, views, seem to have a higher proportion of both uh, human burials and other archaeological evidence. So maybe getting up to the 50% of those caves uh, show evidence of past, mostly prehistoric activity. And this is some, an approach which I very much want to develop further. Um, and uh, I've been contacted by the uh, group which runs the Sandstone Ridge Trust. And they're preparing or um, proposing to survey ca caves and rock shelters in this area. Not very well known as a caving area. Uh, most of the sites are shelter sites like this. They're in sandstone. But the sandstone outcrop is very extensive and it runs uh, right up here in the uh, north, which up to Frodsham in the north and down to Tasson Hall in the south. There are a lot of uh, possible sites here and some, a few have been investigated and have been found to have really quite old remains in them. So, so this is a project where we hope to use uh, citizens to uh, do the walkover survey and recording of these sites. So the other big advance in the last, well, probably since the 90s, has been the availability of computerised records and that then, of course, uh, online accessible open access records. And these are hugely important. Uh, the, uh, one of the most foremost cave investigator, the late uh, Roger Jacobi, had a, had a handwritten archive of uh, artefacts, Paleolithic and Mesolithic artefacts from all over the country, many from cave sites. These have been digitised. They're available on the archaeology data service. That's a fantastic resource for researchers. It's very difficult now to visit some of these museums. Many of the museums have lost their curators. It's, they're hard to access the physical things, but the materials available online. And there are very extensive artifact, uh, archives of, from the Dawson, Jackson and Armstrong um, collections. They're held at Manchester Museum. Uh, the museum has finds from 46 caves in Britain and elsewhere. The finds were accessioned, but they've not been fully catalogued, and much more work needs to be done on them. Uh, a similar situation at Buxton Museum, uh, where they have the nice cave archaeologist study, but um, the, again, the Peakland Archaeological Society made extensive collections uh, and they, they need proper research. And so I'll just end by really just giving acknowledgements to the cavers and the, uh, all of the citizen scientists who have contributed by reporting discoveries, by facilitating access to, uh, to, to the caves. Thanks very much. Thank you.